Today uh, we are discussing an important topic uh, that is company formation and uh, legal compliances, uh, and we have an uh, expert uh, key speaker today uh, that Ari Krishnan B is a chartered accountant and alumnus of IIM Calicut, and uh, he has abundance of experience in this field also. He is a partner of chartered accountancy uh, firms uh, that is Vaso and Shivaram, and also Rajan Associates. Uh, sir, uh, welcome, welcome to uh, welcome you, sir, and uh, thank you for accepting our invitation. Over to you, sir. Yeah, no, uh, th thank you. Uh, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, so I hope uh, <clears throat> all of you are eagerly waiting for uh, the session to know what the what the forms of businesses are and uh, uh, how to get the registration and all those documentation done. So for any activity, uh, so any money making activity. It is important that the first legal step that you take is registering the organization or the business. So there are different ways in which you can do it. And uh, uh, during this session, we will explore what are the different options that are available to you. And also, uh, we will touch upon uh, the legal compliances required under those, uh, <clears throat> uh, you know, once you are registered as a, a business, what are the legal compliances you have to follow. Uh, so. I hope uh, 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 it is comfortable if I speak in English. Uh, yes, sir, yes, sir, because, because we have audience from uh, other states also. So Perfect, perfect. So I will uh, carry on with English. Um, uh, feel free to uh, note down any uh, points that you may have. You can raise your hands or something in between. Uh, I can, I'll answer your questions. Uh, or in case if it's uh, something you can wait, we will. Uh, I'll have a question answer session at the end so that... Uh, I will take it uh, each point. So once I cover each uh, each slide or uh, you know each presentation, I can I will give you time to uh, ask questions on that topic. So I'll start off. So we'll start off with the forms of business. So what are the different forms of business that are available once you once you decide to start your own venture? First, you have something called the sole proprietorship. Uh, when you say sole proprietorship, what it means is basically it is a single member business. So wherein the owner is the same person as the business. So this is the easiest and simplest form of starting a business, which is registering a business under your own name. Now, what it means is it is a non-corporate. It does not have a separate legal entity status. So what it means is you and the business is one and the same. Now, uh, how do you do that? So basically, you can start as an entity by as simple as deciding to start today. Your own PAN card, uh, which, uh, you know, your individual PAN card will be the business's PAN card. PAN card is, as you know, uh, the no PAN number or permanent account number is what the income tax department allows you when you apply for an income tax registration. So it is the same PAN number that you can use for your business. And uh, also, <coughs> uh, another point that you should keep in mind is this form of business has unlimited liability so what does limited and unlimited liability mean uh limited liability means when you do a business and you make a loss or uh, you have a, a lot of liabilities that you cannot meet with your assets for every business that has limited liability your Liability is limited to the amount of capital that you have promised to invest or you have invested. So your personal assets will not become liable for meeting those obligations. Now, let us look at an example. You, you are a sole proprietorship. Sole proprietorship does not have this limited liability clause. So what it means is it has unlimited liability. Now, you do business and you make a loss of 100 rupees. So basically, uh, you do a uh, business, you have a loss, you have 100 rupees to be paid to somebody and you're, you don't have the money to do it in your business. What it means is the court or the government, they will decide that your personal assets are liable. For example, if you have a property or if you have uh, a house or if you have any, any tangible asset that has value, they will try to attach it. And this will be used to clear off the debts of the business. But imagine it is a, a, an entity with limited liability. You can say, no, no, this business has separ uh, separate legal entity status. It is, It has 
limited liability so my personal assets will not become liable for the making up the loss of the business uh, uh, what is another disadvantage so of being a sole proprietorship one of the uh, disadvantages is that you have limited capital and resources so what it means is when you are the business then automatically the amount of money you can invest is only the money that you have you cannot give shares to somebody else it is the registration is in your name you carry on the business if for example something happens to you or say you die then the business automatically comes to a stop so in this form of business you cannot have a, a partner or you know somebody else to share or co invest with you legally uh, so what it means is there is no perpetual succession when you die the business auto also automatically dies the best part of it is there is the simplest form of business it is easy for you to start you can just decide you know take a shops and establishments act license or a panchayat license and you can start off with your business and with regards to the tax rate for this form of business when i say sole proprietorship it is the individual who's the, who is the business owner and the tax rate applicable is the normal individual tax slab rate for example if you have if you uh, know what how income tax works you have different slabs for example up to a certain amount there is no tax if you look at the old scheme say 2.5 lakhs up to 2.5 lakhs there is no tax up to 5 lakhs there is a certain rebate that is available above 5 lakhs you have a certain 20% tax to 10 lakhs about 10 lakhs there is 30% slab, uh, slab similarly in the new scheme for the current year up to 7 lakhs you will end up paying no tax but after that you have tax coming in so this slab benefit is available for income tax if for sole proprietorship and there is a clause for mandatory audit as per income tax act so if only if your turnover is exceeding 1 crore the tax audit limit it becomes applicable and up to 2 crores there is a present option to file presumptive tax returns so when you file presumptive tax returns the uh, objective is you have to show a, a minimum profit of 8% for your business and in which case the audit is not applicable now one dis biggest disadvantage is for any proprietorship generally people international business so for, for example you are dealing with uh, uh, people in a different country or you know if you have exports you are buying from outside india at all those kind of times it is difficult to convince somebody to enter into an agreement with you because if something happens to you the business automatically dies and there is no one is responsible for it so uh, these kind of businesses are suitable when the business is generally small there is no international businesses or are not happening it is all just you and a, a small time business that is happening and which does not require a huge capital so if these conditions are satisfied you can you think you, you it will be good if you can do it as a sole proprietorship but the single biggest disadvantage it is only you who is doing the business and if there is any change you cannot bring in a partner you cannot have a person co investing in your business because the business will be in your name so what if there are more than one person to get i mean if you have a friend or a partner who is joining in your business what are the options available for that we have something called the partnership which is the next form of business a partnership is uh, a legal entity which is formed by two or more people so when there are more than two people involved then you know the <clears throat> uh, minimum number of partners is two you can start a partnership and the partnership is usually entered into through a deed so there is something called the partnership deed and in the partnership deed you mention what the business is who are, who are the partners what are the terms and conditions under which you form a partnership for example how much money each person will bring in how what will be the profit sharing ratio between you you people what happens if there is a loss who how will the loss be shared is there a managing partner is there a are both the, all the partners working partners will salary be payable to partners will interest on capital the investment amount be payable to partners where will the main office of the partnership firm be all these 
these details will be mentioned in the partnership deed partnership deed is a document which is signed by all the partners and it is taken on a stamped paper now then the next question is does partnership deeds need to be registered so partnership deeds generally as per the partnership act even if it is not registered it is legally valid as in the agreement has a legal validity however if you need to give a litigation you need to go to court you need to file a case against somebody for that only registered partnerships are allowed to do that and hence when you start the business when you even if even though it is not mandatory to register a partnership deed it is important that you register it at with the registrar of partnership firms in each state so for each state there will be a registrar for partnerships and it is important for example in kerala it is in trivandrum the most of the states have already made it an online process where it is done online where the submissions are done online so there is no generally travel requirement to travel to the registrar to get the documentation done it is mostly done online in kerala for sure it is done online i am i'm sure it, in most other states also so it is done online now we'll start off with some of the negatives of partnership one again this also has unlimited liability so what does it mean if there is a loss in the business your personal assets become liable now the drawback is imagine there are two partners one person has a good bank balance the other person does not have the partnership act says you have unlimited both partners have unlimited liability so you might have only 50% share in the business but if you have the assets you might end up paying the entire amount towards not just 50% you cannot say my liability is only 50% so i will only pay half of that liability that does not work the court will say no no you have unlimited liability so irrespective of your commitment to the partnership firm all your assets can be used to may good the losses of the partnership firm so that is one big risk in partnerships again there is a small limit to the amount that you can bring in because it is only the partners who will be willing to bring in and those people with high net worth or you know they might be a little reluctant if their shares are lesser because again of this unlimited liability clause no perpetual succession is another perpetual succession means when somebody dies what happens to the partnership or you know what happens to the partnership so when some when a partner dies automatically the partnership comes to an end and that is a big drawback for partnership firms however if there are more than two partners for example there are three or four partners you can have a clause in the partnership deed that says even if one of the partners resigns or dies the partnership does not come to an end you uh, you can say the remaining partners can carry on with the business and you could also have clauses such as uh yeah i, I just saw a message asking whether this presentation can be mailed i i can mail it across to you that is not a problem okay so uh yeah so as i was saying uh you can have a clause in the partnership deed that says uh in case one of the partners dies their legal hire one of their legal hires can be a, added upon a confirmation from all the other legal heirs one of them can be added as a partner under the same terms and conditions along with the partner who uh, passed away so those kind of clauses can be added in the partnership deed or agreement the deed the stamp value depends on each state uh, for example in kerala it's 5000 rupees but there are other states where it is much lesser so uh, the it depends on the each state how much on how stamp paper the deed has to be entered into compared to a sole proprietorship there is slightly more legal compliance involved but compared to the other forms of business such as an a limited liability partnership or a private limited company or uh, uh, say a producer company the uh, legal complexities are much lesser uh, the main law being uh, that you have to follow will be the income tax act again and one of the biggest drawbacks of a partnership firm is that the tax on profit there is a 30% tax on the profits of the organization irrespective of the profit now for example if you are a sole proprietorship and your profit is say less than 2.5 lakhs there is no tax or less than uh, if, if it's as per the new scheme say as per if it is less than 7 lakhs for this current year you end up paying zero tax income tax i'm saying however if it's a partnership 
how it works is even if say the profit is of the firm is 10000 rupees or even 10 rupees there is a flat 30% tax on that profit so what it means is if there is a 10 rupees profit 3 rupees will have to be paid as income tax at the end of the year so this flat tax rate is a, a big drawback for registering partnership firms and the point is even private companies are taxed at a much lesser rate today for example a manufacturing company a new manufacturing company is taxed at around 15% uh if it is not a manufacturing company it is 22% of course surcharge and all is extra but it is 22% and similarly the maximum rate if you go for the old old tax regime is 26% for companies so compared to all that the partnership was taxed at a much higher rate the income tax audits that is the only audit that is applicable to partnership is again depending on the turnover uh, the tax audit limit being uh, 1 crore and uh, 2 crore being the presumptive tax limit uh, another drawback for partnership firms is again uh, for international businesses because there is this uh, perpetual succession issue uh, not many people pr generally prefer having partnership firms as uh, for entering into transactions but however it is not as bad as sole proprietorships again this is suitable for organizations where you know two or more people are willing to work together to form a business where they, you are not looking at uh, too many complexities you are close friends or family so the, even if there is a there are no not much chances of dispute or anything of that sort coming in uh these kind of business where there is limited capital requirement a partnership firm works well now the biggest drawback of partnership firm is again this unlimited liability clause now the next form of business is very similar to a partnership it is in fact a partnership but it's called a limited liability partnership now the partnership as has many advantages like it is very simple the legal formalities are much lesser all these benefits meant there were a lot of people who were willing to enter into partnerships however because of this unlimited liability clause there was a reluctance and it is only a few years back maybe the llp act came in only a few almost a decade back till that time india did not have something called the limited liability partnerships and uh, for the limited liability partnerships the government said we we it is not as complex as private limited companies because the rules to be followed are much simpler but you have all the ease and benefits of partnership with the limited liability clause so uh, what are the salient features we can go through them one by one again being a partnership you have to have a minimum number of two partners there is no maximum limit so what it means is you could have as many as uh, you want but the problem is again this is also written on a stamp paper deed so there is a limitation on how many people can sign a deed and for every change or any change in the deed it requires every, every person signature so practically the numbers although there is no limit mentioned it becomes difficult for a, a large number to be entered into an llp one feature of limited liability companies or limited liability organizations is government tries to restrict that name for example then there is a chance that you know uh, people might use misuse the name so they do not allow names of already existing entities to be uh, for forming new limited liability partner for example if you want to start a new limited liability partnership you need to first check decide on the name and check if there is a similar company or similar llp that is already existing and even if it's a similarly sounding name the department does not give you permission to start that organization and also they check whether there is a trademark in the in that similar name or uh you know uh, the the word that is being used at the as a name now uh this is a corporatized version of partnerships the do documentation is similar uh, it is uh, an agreement on stamp paper it is called the llp agreement or the llp deed where all the partners sign all the rules and regulations regarding the business for what the name is what the business will do who are the partners what is the sharing ratio of the pro profits all those things will similar to a partnership will be again mentioned in the stamp paper deed and there is perpetual succession so what it means is even if one of the partners dies the business does not come to an end the llp continues 
and the legal heirs of those deceased can get automatic rights into the limited liability partnership there is no further documentation required it, it is it is an automatic thing that happens now the compliance cost now as i said partnerships and sole proprietorships the compliances are very simple but there are a few compliance requirements for limited liability partnerships for example you have something like the annual filing now what it means is every company every organization basically uh, a private company or whether it be an llp there is an annual filing that has to be done with the registrar of companies so limited liability partnerships are also governed by the registrar of companies and this registrar of companies is to whom you report all the financial data as well so basically you prepare your financial statements every year and there is a, there are forms to be filed with the registrar of companies and the problem with llp is being a new act the fines are very high for example if you do not file the form on time there is the penalty involved is very high for example there are two forms to be filed form 8 and form 11 and if these forms there is a delay of one day 100 rupees penalty is there on fine so for example uh, and it goes on for every day so what it means is you delay by one month 30 days into 100 you delay by one year it is 365 into 100 for one form and there are two forms to be filed so what happens is if there is a delay you end up paying a huge fine and huge penalty because of for that delay and, and hence you have to be very careful when you form an llp to make sure that you do the annual compliances on time or before time every year one drawback is the 30% tax rate so just like partnership firms income tax act recognizes limited liability partnerships as a partnership firm so what it means is you have to pay tax at flat 30% on the profits so as i said even if there is a very minimal small profit you end up paying a, a big tax on the profits and there is also a clause for mandatory audit so basically llps do not have a mandatory audit unless it is specifically mentioned in the deed so if, for example if you mention in the deed that uh this uh, llp has to be audited every year by chartered accountant there is no mandatory audit unless your turnover exceeds 40 lakhs or your investment the capital exceeds 25 lakhs now what it means is for small llps it is a, a boom you don't end up paying that tax uh, you are sorry uh, you don't end up paying that audit fee uh, at the end of the year if your uh, turnover is less than 40 lakhs or your investment is less than 20 capital is less than 25 lakhs so there is a, a benefit given to small businesses that are registered as llps wherein you don't have to file a tax or uh, the, uh, the audit uh, report along with the annual filings however the income tax returns will have to be filed and the audit for tax audit is the same as uh, mentioned earlier so there is no change in that audit related tax audit income tax related audit which is the 1 crore of the limit but however uh, there is no audit as per the llp act this is something that is becoming very popular now llps because they are a relatively new concept it is becoming very popular recently one of the reasons being that the legal compliances relating to llps is fairly limited compared to private companies when you start a private company lot of rules and regulations have to be followed whereas for llp it is much more relaxed and hence it, this is gaining a lot of popularity in this coming in these years now this is also a familiar concept so basically india didn't have this method of uh, organization uh, and it was something that we saw everywhere else that you know some of the, uh, the other countries in the world had this format and that's why we also decided to do it almost a decade back now more the uh, llps are generally seen to be more, more common for uh, professional organizations like say chartered accountants like our, uh, us you know we generally seem to uh, prefer more organizations such as llp for the limited liability clause which is not there in the partnership now we covered sole proprietorship partnerships and limited liability partnerships the next 
is the most common method of our business organization that uh, is getting popular in the limited liability space and this is kadak private limited company now private limited companies again is a very old concept so the, the companies act the first companies act uh, of independent india was made in 1956 so even before that we had the old companies act but 1956 companies act was the one the first one after our independence so right from those days we have had companies being registered in india and uh in 2013 also the new companies act was formed and 2014 it came into being and uh, it, you know the much more than much more than llps uh, india still produces many more private limited companies than llps so this is the most common method of uh, organization for limited liability businesses now with regards to company there are two points to be noted one minimum two directors are required for private companies and minimum two shareholders and these two shareholders can be the directors as well so basically minimum two people are required to form a private company uh, I, i just saw one question but i'll take it at the end of the slide okay uh, so at least two persons are for forming private limited companies the private the companies act 2014 restricts it to 200 shareholders at a maximum so basically when you say uh, shareholder how many people can form in a company the 200 is the limit unique name is similar to what as i said for partnership llps now the reason is uh you they don't allow you to form something that has a similar name already existing or somebody who already has a trademark now something to be kept in mind is they they look for even similarly sounding names so what it means is you might have a company as you know in very similar as there are many alphabets which sound similar for example uh s and z z so s and z uh sometimes you can interchange and use and it sounds different uh, slightly similar but it's different or similarly c and k at times can be read to uh, you know sometimes c is read as k so all these kind of things uh are checked at the time of applying for the unique name so they do not permit uh even similarly sounding names so in case if there is a company called say wipro wipro is a company that we all know it is w i p r o but if you apply for a name with v i p r o wipro they will not allow that name they say it is similarly sounding to another company that is already existing so this is something to be kept in mind while you apply for the name now this is a corporate form of business uh and unlike a stamp, stamp paper deed uh which is there for partnerships or sole proprietorships where all the terms and conditions are mentioned for private limited companies the charter documents are called the memorandum of association and articles of association the memorandum association is a document that talks about the name of the company uh the object of the company what the company's uh, activities are going to be who are the uh, the say signing signatories of memorandum association uh where the office of the business uh, the registered office will be located uh all uh, the, what the capital of the uh, company will be all these documents mentioned are, all these are mentioned in the memorandum of association and articles of association is the document or it is the bylaw which basically tells you how the operations the internal operations of the controls in the organization are done for example it will mention who are constitute the board of directors what is the quorum required for the meetings uh who is a you know what are the rights and responsibilities uh, who gets to decide the rights and responsibilities of the directors all these kind of items are mentioned in the articles of association basically it is the internal bylaw articles of association can be considered as the internal bylaw now uh the company also has the advantage of being a perpetual succession so basically you can now have a nominee and a, a legal hire who can who will take over the business uh, or who, who gets to share who gets the shares that you had when you die so there is perpetual succession and just because one of the uh, shareholders dies the business does not come to an end the business can carry on and their legal heirs can become shareholders in that business the biggest disadvantage is the legal formalities now there are a lot of compliance forms that are required when the new companies act that uh, came in so in 2013 
it it tried to take into control uh, take into uh, you know uh, mind the various frauds that happened for example you had the sahara fraud sahara you had satyam scandal you had the sharda chit fund scam in the west bengal so all these were in the mind of those people creating the law so what it meant is they put a lot of restrictions and lot of legal requirements for companies when they created it and uh, these legal compliances um, and costs are very high compared to the other forms of business for uh, ensuring that you uh, comply with all these uh, rules so for example you have uh, the annual filing forms which are common for most businesses uh, but you also have forms like msme form forms like dpt3 these are all for additional forms that you know only companies end up filing compared to other forms of business and hence generally if you compare with any other forms of business uh, companies end up having a lot more legal compliance to be followed but the good part is if you are a company then there is a general feeling that you are somebody who is complying with all these rules and regulations and hence you know if uh, there is an international trade or any for international business and all or if you want to attract investment from uh, angel funds or in, uh, professional investors and funds generally they feel that you know private companies are better off to invest in and put money in and hence once you reach a certain scale it is best that you know you form a private company the tax rate for companies it is much lesser than uh, you know uh, for uh, partnership firms and llps uh, the lowest being 15% plus surcharge and uh, the highest being 26% so basically it is still much uh, easy, uh, less taxing than an llp or a private limited company when it comes to income tax another new form of business that came in was the opc or the one person company so there was always this concern you know when i have two and more people i can either form a limited liability partnership or i can form a private limited company and ensure that i have limited liability in the business however if i was a single person i had only option of sole proprietorship and sole proprietorships had unlimited liability which meant my personal assets were liable and because of that the uh, the new companies act they formed something called one person company and for these one person companies the benefit was that uh, even if you are one person you get you could register as a company and this company would have limited liability one drawback was even if there is a one person company you at least required two people to form it because there was a, there had to be a nominee who would uh, take over the business in case something happened to you so again uh, this did not click off very well because you had to have a nominee so basically you still required two people then why not just form a private company so that i don't have to come you know i i would have the benefits of my private company as well now uh, Uh, while carrying on the business, rather than you know showing it as an OP OPC, because anyway I require two people to carry on. And hence, this is not a very popular form. But there are a few people who have registered one-person companies. And uh, uh, the big another point is that uh, after a certain point of time, uh, uh, even one-person companies once they reach two crore turnover, they are mandatorily required to convert into a private company so and from that point onwards there is no difference between a private company and a one person company the do documentation costs are slightly lower compared to uh say uh, a private company or an llp uh, but again once you reach the 2 crore turnover it is the same the tax rate also is similar to other private companies it it is best when there is this one person who wants to do the business they and uh, you've not found a partner so far to carry on the business in that case the best part is to do a uh, a one person company now another form of business that i wanted to touch upon is the producer company okay so with producer companies what is a producer company so the government we all already had the cooperative societies so the government's idea was to bring into Uh, existence a new form of business which comes under the companies act companies act is a very wide act it you know covers a lot of areas it is very well drafted uh, you know uh, act the government wanted that kind of security to you know to be brought into the normal agri kind of business so 
uh, with some of the benefit features of a cooperative society with uh, some of the benefits of a private company. So together, bringing these two together, they formed a, a new type of organization and the company is actually called producer company. So what are the features? It is only for agri-related business activities. Uh, then the minimum capital requirement as per this act, uh, this method of organization is 5 lakhs. Now, it requires minimum of 5 directors to start with uh, and uh, a it requires a minimum of 10 shareholders to start. Or else you have to have two producer organizations to come together to form a producer company. It, although it is a private company, they have, there is no restriction on the number of shareholders. So what it means is it can have as many shareholders as, as it can have, but the catch being all of them should be producers. They should be doing the segregated related business that the organization is registered to do. The unique name clause is applicable and the limited liability clause is also applicable. And it has some features of a public company, like uh, there is no limit on the shareholders. The charter documents are the same as private companies. You have a memorandum of association and the articles of association. And there is also perpetual succession. Compared to, uh, uh, you know, the le legal formalities for pri uh, private companies, see, it, if you compare it with the public company, it is much lesser. So, and uh, producer companies uh, are treated on par with the private companies when it comes to uh, the uh, legal compliances. And now, there is again the taxation on the activity. Uh, something that I wanted to touch upon on the tax front, if it's a, a pure agricultural business, uh, agriculture, so basically if it's agricultural production that uh, any business is doing, agriculture is tax exempt in India. For example, uh, you know, you do some, you uh, you cultivate something, you make, uh, you know, you actually sell it, sell, sell it in the market, there is no tax as such. However, if there is a processing involved, if there is a, you know, a, a value adding uh, activity involved, at that point of time, the income tax taxation provisions can come into being. Uh, and uh, for producer companies, there is a section called ATPA, which helps uh, helps it or makes it on par with on taxation with regards to uh, say cooperative societies. So. There is a section called ATP for uh, cooperative societies and uh, even up to 100% tax exemption is given under ATPA for producer companies, depending on the activities that they are, that they are involved in. And uh, another point to note is uh, this ATPA section, as of now, there is a sunset clause where you know, it is up to 2025 that uh, the tax benefits are given, but you could always see it getting extended. Uh, so. Uh, there is, uh, as of now, you get to take the benefit of ATPA. Now, the next point is regarding uh, the, the, the nature of activities that are permitted for companies, uh, the producer companies and the uh, producer companies. First is, the business activities have to be primarily either production, manufacture or procurement of primary produce. And two, the marketing, you know, or the second activity would be marketing business. That is, these are businesses that market, uh, educate and promote the primary produce amongst the consumers. The third part is the technical service businesses. These are businesses that conduct research into existing practices of production and provide training and technical assistance to the producers. For example, you do that, you provide training to the primary producers. These are the activities and four, you could be doing the financing for these production producing activities. And fifth could be infrastructure, which is basically providing the infrastructure facilities for the primary producer pro, 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 producing of these goods. So basically, producer companies are allowed to do these five activities. The next is what are the steps for incorporation? Now, for uh, any company that is incorporated, what are, what are the steps involved for incorporating these entities? The first step is taking a digital signature. So basically all the forms. So basically uh, when uh, the entire process of incorporation is done online and uh, all these forms are required to be signed by the directors and the first shareholders. And uh, 
this the signing is done through digital signatures so hence everyone will have to take digital signatures for applying for the name the next step is application for the name so basically when you apply for the name the points to be kept in mind are that it should be unique it should not be similar to existing names as i said you know even similarly sounding names are not permitted and there should not be a trademark for the uh, the name that you have selected under the same under the clause under which your activity would be formed the next step once you get the name would be to draft the legal documents so basically uh, your memorandum of association and articles of association will be filled it will tell you how much money will be uh, invested in the business who all will be the directors who all will be the shareholders uh, what will be the value of the share where will the uh, location of the business be the registered office be uh, all these conditions would be mentioned in the memorandum and articles and articles as it is the bylaw and then you have uh, some consent letters which basically uh, a step up is gives giving permission to becoming a director in the company then there's a declaration uh, affidavits are not required anymore uh, there's a declaration that says uh, that i am not uh, debarred from becoming a director or a shareholder in a company from any rules or regulations i have not been i have not violated any rules in the past all these kind of things are there and then uh, it is about just uploading that form and getting the incorporation done nowadays along with the incorporation you also you are also allowed the income tax pan number uh, esi pf registrations uh, a bank account uh, gets automatically opened so you can so when you file the form you can choose which bank you want to open an account in and that bank will automatically communicate to you asking if uh, the process can be completed for opening the bank account so all these have these are all new new uh, for things that have come in because the government is trying to make it simpler for forming new organizations so earlier you had to first incorporate then apply to the income tax department for your uh, uh, pan card similarly uh, the tan registration will have to be applied gst registration again you have to separately apply then you have to uh, go to the bank to uh, open a bank account esi pf all required separate separate registrations now all this automatically happens when you form a company because every other registration was automatically taken and for esi and pf and all you can inform them that if you don't have the requisite number of employees you can inform them that it is at this point of time we are our uh, number of employees are lesser and hence you are not, we do not require the esi pf it is a declaration that you just need to file in their website and the uh, file you know the status becomes dormant and then you don't have to file the forms so basically this is the incorporation process now we we'll let us look at what are the documentation requirements documents required for incorporation so uh, the first one would be <coughs> excuse me digital signatures for all subscribers so, so as i said these are all online forms and hence you need to have digital signatures for filing these forms pan card number aadhar works uh, pan pan and aadhar aadhar if you have that works perfectly fine and then pan card is also a must if for you to become a director or a uh, uh, you know a co-founder in a company another point that you have to uh, have is uh, you have to take a dit which is a director's identification number so any whenever you become a director or a, a promoter in a company you need to have mandatorily have the din number din is direct uh, director certification number then uh, another document you'll have to have this is a bank, bank statement of all the directors when you have a registered office you need to have a registered office and you need to have a rent agreement or an noc for that office for example if you own the one of the, the promoters own the office it is the noc that is the bill that is required for example if you want to incorporate a company uh, they will ask for a utility bill which is an electricity bill or a telephone bill in the name of the building owner to be attached as an attachment in you know, form of the company the typical cost for a private company would be around 15000 rupees one five generally that is a rate that you end up paying for, for starting a private company now limited liability partnerships again the form the requirements are almost the same in addition you need to have a 1000 rupees stamp paper which is the additional uh, wherein the deed would be documented 
also uh another uh, when it comes to partnership firms the pan or the aadhar card is uh, the requirement of passport size photograph sig signature of all the partners there is, there is no digital signature required but all the partners need to have a uh, the sign has to be scanned and attached separately stamp paper again it depends on the state can much uh, lesser and then now this i just covered the registration now uh, i will i can take questions on this registration part before i move into the compliance perspective uh any specific questions sir regarding partnership i want to clear it out of mind uh, partnership firm. sure, sure. Uh, go ahead yeah yeah we have a partnership already registered and mm -hmm. uh, uh if we want to uh, add some more people into that partnership uh do we have to go in for uh, an amendment of the document or uh, we just again add it uh, by uh, notifying the registrar about this okay so uh if there is any if, if there is any change in the uh, partnership uh, for in the if there is a change in the percentage because when new person comes in the change will be there automatically because the existing partners will have a change in the proportionate uh, percentage uh, that they are presently sharing so it will require an amended deed and a fresh deed so there will be uh, stamp paper deeds required uh, when you do that and one only once that is done the registrar will permit the uh, the the change or the addition of the new direct a uh, new new partners so we have to buy the 5000 stamp paper again yes you will have to because if there is a change in percentage it is in kerala that is the rule i will i am not sure about the other states but yes in okay. kerala if yeah. it is uh, that is the rule yeah. you will end up, you will end yeah. up to uh, you will have to do a re, uh, reconstitution because there is a change in the percentage okay 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 all right thank you sir uh, any other questions Ah, uh, well, I just saw two questions in the uh, chat. I'll just take it. Is vesting to be mentioned while registering? So, uh, Ismail, I hope uh, what you are meaning is uh, vesting is for. So, basically, vesting means uh, you are not giving the shares to a person not right now, but you decide to give it at a certain point of time. For example, ESOP. Where uh, for as uh, for example, if there is a uh, somebody who is working in your organization. you say you work with me for 3 years uh, i will give you x amount of shares uh, i i hope that is what you meant by vesting if that is the case when you form the company this is not mentioned but there is separate disclosure form filing requirements for vesting with the registrar of companies so when you form the company form it with the person who already are can or are or are holding the shares there are already people there make sure you these are people who are already will own there is no vesting involved so say for example uh, you and one of your partners there are two assume there are two people uh, say you and a partner but the partner is not investing any amount he is only working for you in that case when you are registering the company the, if you give the shares at that point of time when you are registering it automatically becomes vested so one option you could have is you can form a company with say uh, a family or a family member or someone and then have a separate agreement entering to do with this with your partner who is working wherein you mention you work for x amount of years you will be given this amount of shares and that needs to be informed to the registrar of companies there is a form to be filed and that vesting uh, can happen over that period of time however the agreement is i hope that i have answered that question uh, uh, feel free to ask uh, if you have further doubts now another question that has come up in the chat is do producer companies have mandatory audit absolutely yes they have they have mandatory audit and uh, uh, it is important that you file the uh, mandatory uh, the, the forms after audit because uh, the fines are also very high just like i said for llps it is 100 rupees per form per day so for every delay you are of one day you are paying 100 rupees fine so imagine uh, missing out for one month you end up paying a 3000 uh, rupee fine for one form and there are multiple forms to be filed 
so this is absolutely mandatory for producer companies audits are mandatory even if there is no transaction probably the only transaction is you might have taken a bank account and the bank has taken some bank charges even then the audit is absolutely mandatory as per the companies act uh the next question that uh, has come up in the chat is we have formed a producer company in 2020 do but no transactions capital was put in the bank to the day what are the requirement of compliance so as i said uh, i think i just answered that question it is mandatory audit uh so in april 23 if it has come so you said you formed the company in may 22 but no transactions so uh, there is one form that you might have missed filing which is uh, the commencement of business form so the rule says if you formed a company within 6 months there is a form called commencement of business that needs to be filed and uh, uh, i'm if the cap capital has probably come back come in only april 23 there could be a violation of that uh, provision and you might end up getting a notice from the roc and the fines are pretty big so you might end up paying a few lakh as fine so if the notice does come so there is a risk involved there in that uh, if you've not followed that a uh, six month rule for uh, uh, commencement of business filing now uh, if you've already done that well and good and uh, because the company was incorporated in may 2022 and there is no even though there is no transactions you are required to file the tax filing forms for may 20 uh, you know the financial year 22 23 which is the year that is ending on 31st march 2023 so you will have to file the uh, you will have to prepare an audit report you will have to prepare uh, the income tax form and you will have to comply for the 2022-23 financial year now uh, uh, from 23 onwards again the same rules will apply so only for a company if it is formed in the last 3 months of the financial year say for example january uh, you form a company you form a private company in january or say february or march for those companies they have a specific provision that says you can club these three months with the next financial year and then form file the form with the roc in the next financial year so basically uh, it can be a 15 month financial year that you file for the first year so imagine i formed a company in say january 1st 2023 i don't uh, do the annual filing with roc for these three months january february march that financial year but with a uh, 23 24 financial year after the next march i can club these three months together and form file the roc forms but uh, one point to keep in mind is there is no benefit like that involved in income tax act for the three months you will have to prepare your balance sheet and pnl account or no audit requirement but you will have to file the uh, it return uh, audit will depend on the turnover that you have so uh, if you have more than 1 crore you might have to do that turnover also but or our tax audit also but otherwise there is no audit requirement but you will have to file your it returns uh, hello sir very uh, good evening may i ask a question go sure go ahead yeah okay uh, sir i had uh, joined in this meeting very late uh, it's after all that jo uh, one man company from the runwards before that you have you you could have covered about uh, limited liability forms okay llp yeah, llp right llp right, or right. right llp llp yeah in, the, in that sector uh, may i ask you one thing uh, how many uh, this uh, shares can be issued uh, in a single llp in, a, in the sense how many uh, partners can be joined yeah so basically llp act does not have a number maximum limit so but uh, the roc form there is a restriction for for 200 line items so practically right, right. Uh, mm. practically it is uh, 200 but uh, there is no limit as per the act and and, and, and again the, and there is a problem of uh, signing on the stamp paper so because uh, stamp papers are the deed happens in a stamp paper there is limit on how many people can sign on the stamp paper that's all all right right okay and uh, one more in the same part Uh, what will be the partners uh, uh, like? Uh, how will be the partners' role in that? Uh, there will be uh, somewhat like designated partners, and it can be. Uh, will it be limited to a certain number? These designated partners. No. So basically, how how it works is just like in the companies. 
you have directors and shareholders right so basically uh, directors run the show shareholders are the owners just like that in llps partnerships uh, in llps are limited liability partnerships so partners are the owners designated partners have the role of running the business that's all so there's no limit as such so designated partners uh, the only thing is uh, they they are the ones eligible to take salary or they are the ones who are working for the firm on a regular basis that's all okay okay fine and uh, uh, one more thing if such a firm estimated to start after two, two two years for an example and uh, they are starting by 2025 uh, december and they are right now collecting the investment or else the shares uh, then if someone wants to withdraw uh, within next one year itself is there any legal issue legal problem or legal uh, return something like that it's a no, general there is, no no uh, uh, if somebody wants to leave and they all, all the others agree there is nothing wrong so uh, you know or the if, if the others are willing there is no restriction you could leave okay otherwise they can they can put any like uh, certain percentage this much will be uh, like uh, right or off like that decision also can be taken it, it could be fine? there see if the it is mentioned in the deed at the time of entering it can be there so when you are see when you are joining first there is the llp agreement or the llp deed so what are right. the terms and conditions mentioned there you are you are signatory to it so uh, there is no restriction if, uh, for implementing that but okay, uh, the, ch the challenge comes when somebody wants to leave and somebody else is not permitting it because uh, again llp unlike in a private company uh, a mm, right. if you want to transfer your uh, ownership to somebody else being a, a a document on stamp paper it requires everyone's signature Okay. So, so you know if there are some people who are reluctant to let you go then it becomes a trouble for llps but whereas for private companies the benefit is that if you want to transfer the shares and the director board approves it and the director board can be constituted by this 51% of the majority it is simple majority rule that comes in so even if there are 49% people who are against you moving out if the majority 51% is supporting you you can get that transfer done and move out of the business okay which is a restriction for limited liability partnership firms now uh, another question that has come is uh, sir is there any kind of tax exemption for incentive available for agri businesses yes as i said you know pure agriculture is tax exempt in india so in india agricultural income is not taxable except for rate purposes for example if you have multiple revenue sources and then uh, you end up paying a small tax on the agricultural income as well for the rate purpose however if you have only agricultural income it is not taxable in india and it is the same for any organization however uh, if you are an organization that produces does value addition for example it is not purely pure agriculture but if you do an activity that adds value to the produce or something then taxation is applicable uh, as i said there are certain provisions available for cooperative societies as well as uh, producer companies that give you exemption such as uh, section 80pa and 80p which provides certain benefits of tax depending on the nature of activity that you do uh you know the you could end up paying zero tax also uh, if it's a pure agricultural business or something so the these are the tax incentives available uh now uh, another question is hello sir is a self help group registered under society second kerala and does they require any registration under any other a uh, firm registration for selling value added products no so if you are a society you are very well allowed to carry on the business uh, as a society itself there is no further registration re required the society can produce uh, manufacture or uh, you know uh, do value addition and uh, sell the product yeah pradyum bhave i saw that hand raised you can ask a question hello hello yeah go ahead pradyum yeah i can hear you as uh, a uh, for solo proprietorship uh, is said that uh, up to 7 lakh there is uh, no tax no so what yeah. about so uh, as per, yeah. in how it works actually right so, so so gst irrespective of the nature of business the rules are the same so even if you are a non profit organization whether you are a profit organization whether you are individual whether you are a partnership firm whether you are a private company llp there is no difference in uh, the gst rule gst is still applicable based on your turnover 
So if you are producing goods or manufacturing goods or your agri business, you are a trader. The limit is forty lakhs. So the moment uh, your turnover or the income crosses forty lakhs, you are mandatorily required to take the GST registration. Similarly, if you are into interstate business or export business, irrespective of the turnover, you are required to mandatorily take the GST registration. So there is no change in the rules with regards to income tax on based on the nature of your organization. So uh, I will come to those kind of points, which is the next slide. So uh, if the questions are done on the incorporation part, I can just move to that. Uh, shall I move, sir? Uh, one more question, sir. Yeah, sure. Go ahead. Go ahead. I'm I'm I'm, I'm listening. Go ahead. Yeah, I mean, sir, that I, means I, uh, below of uh, forty uh, lakh, there is uh, so we don't have to pay GST. Or, below forty. Uh, yeah, so the registration is not lax. I I will explain. I will explain. Okay. So uh, below forty lakhs, there is no mandatory registration GST registration required. But if you already taken a registration, then it is mandatory that you collect tax as well as pay tax. Uh, is that clear? Any any, any further questions okay. required? Yeah. Uh, uh, if you have any questions, do ask. I'll just clear that and move to the next slide. Sir, one more thing. Okay. Uh, can a uh, partnership firm uh, take a share in a private limited company and vice versa? I mean, uh, can a private limited company take up a uh, share in a partnership firm? Okay. So basically, uh, private. It is difficult for private uh, for I mean, say partnership firms to have shares in the private company because uh, even if a partnership company, uh, you know. It has to have a, a separate legal entity status. So, even if when a partnership firm holds shares in the company, it is uh, in the name of a one of the partners or in the name of multiple partners. So, generally, it will not be in the name of a partnership firm. So, legally, as per Com Partnership Act, you cannot do it. But when you hold it, it will be in the individual names of the partners which are brought into the books as of the partnership firm. For example. Uh, the funds might go from the partnership firm, but the shares will be held in the name of the partner, and, but not in the name of the partnership firm. But vice versa is permitted. Private companies can hold shares in partnership firms because they have separate legal entity status. Private companies can hold shares in partnership firms. Thank you, sir. Okay. So, uh, yeah, moving on. What are the documentation and compliance requirements for companies and organizations? Now, once you form an organization, it is important that you maintain details about all your cash and bank transactions, all the invoices that you are raising, all your expense bills and vouchers. And then you make sure that you do it on a regular basis so that last minute rush can be avoided. And at any point of time, there is an audit or income tax department assessment, you will have to mandatorily take the uh, uh, and submit the documentation. For a company, there is a minimum number of board meetings required. So for example, board meeting generally means the meeting of the directors of the company. So for board meetings, the, the rule says a minimum of four meetings are required if it is a, a normal private company and a minimum of two is required if it's a very small company. So four meetings, one every quarter. So one every three months, there should be a meeting of the board. And the difference between the dates, you know, of two board meetings should not be more than 120 days. So these are criteria that the Companies Act mandatorily requires you to follow. Similarly, there should also be a general body meeting. So a general body meeting means meeting of all the shareholders. So board meeting means meeting of the director board. General body meeting means meeting of the entire shareholders of the company. This has to be there mandatorily at least once in a year, which is called the annual general body meeting. And it is at this annual general body meeting that the accounts of the uh, you know the organization will be submitted for approval. Similarly, all major decisions like you know appointment of directors, removal of directors, all these points will be taken up in general body meeting. Now, another point important uh, to be discussed is the agreements that are required to be maintained by a company. Whenever you enter into agreement, it is important that you keep a copy of that agreement in the office. Similarly. All the decisions taken on the board meeting, make sure the minutes of all these board meetings, minutes of all the general body meetings. If it is a partnership firm, meeting of all the partners. So basically, 
when a partnership partners meet make sure there is a, a documentation uh, maintained regarding the decisions taken at the partnership meeting and it is signed by all the partners generally in a partnership there is a clause that says you know any amendment to the partnership date can be made by the partners in their meeting and that, that is why it is important that you maintain the in writing the decisions taken at the partnership uh, you know partners meet as well now a company is also required to maintain a list of registers like who are the list of who are the shareholders who are the directors who are the key managerial personnel all these details have to be maintained by the company and also all the agreements that you enter into such as the nda nda means non disclosure agreement there could be service agreements there could be sales agreement there could be purchase agreement with vendors shareholder agreements and investor agreements with people who have invested money into your company ease of agreements for for example the vesting agreement that uh, somebody had asked you know uh, those kind of agreements rent agreements all these should be documents that should be properly maintained by any organization as i said with board meetings there should be at least four meetings uh, for a company the gap between two meetings should not be more than 120 days and uh, the minutes of those meetings have to be taken for example some of the major decisions that are taken in board meetings are decisions on taking loans opening bank accounts appointing direct other direct, additional directors auditors you know uh, deciding to whether go for a right issue of shares further share issue all these are major decisions that are taken by the board and some of these board decisions once they board approves it it has to go to the shareholders for approval for example the financial statement need to be approved by the shareholders if new shares are being issued it has to be informed to them first all these require uh, shareholder approval also and this happens in the general body meeting the mandatory general body has to happen before the september 30th of every month so in india you have the financial year which is april to march so after march 31st before that september 30th you have to hold that an annual general meeting wherein the accounts will be presented for approval also uh, the auditor appointment also happens in the general body meeting uh some when uh, it is uh, say the company decides to say issue new shares in the middle of the year in that scenario also you know require uh, you know the shareholder approval in which case what we do is we call for a, a general body meeting which is called the extraordinary general body meeting now for increasing capital issuing new shares for making any changes in the bylaw all these require all the shareholders approval and hence these are things that are generally taken the extraordinary general body meeting of companies now statutory filings to be done you have the annual audit uh, which is mandatory for companies for llps only if your turnover exceeds 40 lakhs it is mandatory audit similarly for partnership firms and uh, you know sole proprietorships the audit the audit applicable is only for the income tax purpose there is no other statutory audit required but whereas for uh, companies and llps income tax audit based on the turnover is one audit that is required statutory audit as per roc registrar of companies is the other audit so basically there could be two audits that happen mm -hmm. now uh the financials uh audit is done every year uh and then uh, there are annual filing forms to be filed and the late fee for these forms as i said is 100 rupees per day which is kind of harsh on uh, small companies uh aoc4 and mgt7 are the name of these forms that are filed by companies uh, the annual forms you also have other forms such as the msme the msme form is a form that needs to be filed by companies that have outstanding dues with msme for example you are buying something from an msme organization you are required to mandatorily uh for, uh, show the outstanding balance uh, and form file the form msme form uh, with the roc similarly there is a form called dpt3 which shows the deposits or the loans that uh, the company has, has taken and uh, this has to be informed with roc so these are all additional forms that have come in recently which makes the uh, compliance requirements for companies slightly much more than say other or forms of organizations including llps what are the other uh, for requirements when you know you will have to inform the roc about some of the general common ones are issuing new shares appointing a director appointing auditors taking a loan uh, by giving a, a security releasing a property so while if a loan repayment is done then and releasing of that security increasing share capital changing your office changing the directors these are all important decisions which require uh, roc approval 
so there are two types of decisions uh, that are uh, required to be uh, that a company can take some are uh, decisions that require only a, a simple majority for example appointing a director requires only a 51% majority but for example there are certain other decisions like say new share issue which requires a special resolution a special resolution means three fourth of those present will have to vote in favor of the resolution for it to pass it is not more than half it becomes three fourth so those are and uh, those kind of resolutions are called special resolutions now some of the fines uh, as i said you know it is 100 rupees per day for forms uh, for form aoc for an mgt7 which is the annual form it is 100 rupees per day uh, there is another new form that is coming called the kyc which is a director kyc for every year uh, every, every person who holds a din director's identification number they are mandatorily required to file a form called uh, uh, kyc and if it is not filed within the due date 5000 rupees is the penalty for for that director for not uh, filing that form on time and uh, similarly for other forms it is like uh, up to 30 days delay there will be a normal fine up to 30 days it is normal fee but uh, more than 30 days two times the normal fee similarly there is a, a table which says you know if there is more than 6 months it is 12 times the normal fee that you end up paying as fine now if you don't file your uh, return annual returns for 3 years you will be debarred by the, the company can be spiked off by the registrar of companies if you don't file your annual returns for three years and the directors will be debarred or disqualified for a period of five years which means you will cannot continue as a director in any or other company for five years so imagine you are a director in two companies one company does not file the returns for three years you get debarred and you cannot become a director even in the other company which is regular in all filings for a period of five years so these are some of the penalties for non-compliance for companies. Now, uh, what, uh, another rule that everyone has to follow is the income tax rules. So basically income tax, uh, again, for individuals, it is a slab rate. For companies, again, it, it depends on the, up to, it can be around 25% or 15%. If it's a manufact new manufacturing entity, it could be 26% is the maximum tax rate. For partnership firms, it is 30%, a flat rate. The, the tax filing due date is uh, for companies, it is September 30th. It is July for normal partnerships and individuals, July 31st. And if there is tax audit involved, it is again September 30th. And now uh, it is October for uh, companies and other tax audits. So basically, you have September 30th as the due date for uploading the tax audit form and October 31st for the IT return filing. So that is the new rule that has come in from this year onwards. If uh, so, somebody asked me uh, and asked me at an earlier session, you know, what happens if you are in a loss, there is no tax to be paid. So, should I file my tax returns? So, the, my answer was it is more important that you file your tax returns on time if you are making loss, because then if you are making loss, if you file your tax returns on time, you are allowed to carry forward that loss. Now, what that means is imagine you, you did a business, you made a loss of 100 rupees. Next year, you made a, a, a profit of 150 rupees. So if you had filed your tax returns on time in the first year when you made that loss, in the next year, when your profit is 150, you can reduce that loss that you made in the first year. For example, 100 rupees was the loss you made in the first year. You can reduce that and pay the balance um, tax only on the balance, basically on the 50 rupees. So you made profit of 150 rupees in the first second year, reduce the loss in the first year, 100 rupees and the 50 on only on the 50 rupees you end up paying the tax so the answer is if you are in losses it is more important that you file your tax returns on time so that you are allowed to carry forward this loss if you have profits even if you have delay there is only an interest in the penalty that you end up paying uh, as fine but uh, when you are in losses make sure that you absolutely find it within time now, uh, if your turnover is more than one crore, the tax audit limit is applicable and you have to get your audit, tax returns also audited and filed by the, uh, you need a certificate from the chartered accountant. The uh, form is called 3C or the 3CB and the 3CD form is uploaded, has to be uploaded by the chartered accountant. The penal, there is again, uh, if you don't file your returns, there is penalty involved, which can be, you know, it can go up to tax. So uh, if there is a, uh, if you don't do the audit or if you don't file it uh, within the time. Now, another point 
important in time, income tax that you need to keep in mind is the TDS. Uh, for example, uh, if you uh, there are certain expenses that the government has said, which if you are incurring, you have to deduct TDS. Some of the common ones are professional fee. Uh, see, for example, something like you pay to a chartered accountant. It comes under professional fee. So if you're paying more than 30,000 in a year to a professional, you have to deduct the 10% as TDS and deposit that to the government. And the, per, the person who uh, provided the service, he can file his tax returns and claim it. So it gets either registered towards his tax liability or he can claim a refund. Similarly, for rent, if you're paying more than 2.4 lakhs rent in a year, 10% has to be deducted as TDS. 2% if it is movable property. Similarly, if there is any other contract, say manufacturing, labor contract, transportation, any other contract, if uh, the value of the service over the year is more than 1 lakh, it has to be deducted. Also, if a single invoice is there for more than 30,000 rupees, that also attracts TDS. Another point is salary. If you are paying salary, TDS is applicable based on the tax lab rate. So basically, if you have that person, uh, you have to calculate an employee's tax based on his income. And whatever is the tax liability that he has, that has to be deducted as TDS. Similarly, if you're paying commission also for more than 15,000 rupees to a person in a year, 5% commission will have to be, 5% uh, TDS will have to be deducted from that person. Now, what happens if this TDS is not deducted? For income tax, they ask you to disallow 30% of that expense. So, for example, if you have 10 lakhs uh, as commission uh, that you have paid, you will not be allowed to claim expenses of 30% of that, which is uh, 3 lakhs. So imagine you have profit of 1 lakh. If you have, if you forget to deduct uh, TDS, this 3 lakh gets added back. So you end up paying tax on 4 lakhs instead of the 1 lakh that you were supposed to pay. So that is why TDS deduction is very important. Now moving on to GST. GST registration, as I said, is 40 lakhs uh, for goods and uh, manufacturing uh, organizations and traders, 20 lakhs for service providers. So when your revenue uh, goes above that limit, you are mandatorily required to file your uh, uh, file the registration forms. Another point to note is if you are dealing with a purely exempted goods or purely exempted service, then GST is not mandatory. But exemption and zero rated both are different. So you might have products that are zero rated, but uh, exempted means uh, that is a different category. Both have no, no tax, but uh, both are treated separately for uh, tax, uh, you know, for registration and tax purposes. Uh, so uh, that, that again is GST and GST also it is important because uh, you can, uh, if you do, there is any delay in payment, 18% is the interest of the child uh, that is charged by the government on delayed payments. Similarly, the if you don't file your returns on time also, there is a per day 20 rupees uh, fine uh, that is payable by the person. Uh, LLPs, there are two forms, again, annual uh, filing to be done. Uh, again, as I said, uh, that is a 100 rupees fine, again, that uh, is applicable for each form. So what are the other important registrations that you will have to take? Uh, one for, for agricultural producers, for, for sure, one thing that you will have to take is uh, FSSI registration. FSSI registration, uh, there are three types. So up to, up to 12 lakhs turnover, it is a very simple registration. The, uh, after 12 lakhs, up to 20 crores, uh, it's the state registration and after that is the center registration. So, but it is important that anyone dealing with food or consumer food products, even trading, you are required to mandatorily take the FSSI registration. It is done online. The process is also a very simple process, which will have to be followed. Now, if the moment you are in uh, moving into international transactions, you have to mandatorily take an IE code, which is the import-export code. Uh, it is given by the... Uh, uh, foreign uh, foreign transaction uh, trading department and uh, department of foreign trade uh, dgft and uh, it is the same number as your pan number so basically when you apply for dgft the ie code number that is allotted to use the same as pan number pan in income tax pan but it is mandatory that you apply for it separately and you get a certificate uh, certificate for uh, you know uh, doing international transaction this is required for import as well as export for example if you want to import some machinery for uh, agricultural processing or something even then ie code is mandatory uh, another registration you could look at is the uh, startup india scheme and the msme registration 
which is uh, giving you a lot of benefits in terms of uh, government uh, you know application uh, if you want to participate in a tender or something of that sort there are a lot of benefits available also whenever you start an organization keep in mind the local authorities so uh, you will have to get the panchayat or the municipal corporation license and the trade license to carry out activities on this uh, carry out the activities of the business at that loca locality so i think uh, the time allotted was uh, till 5:30 so i'll just uh, take up questions uh, and then uh, i can uh, wind up the session i'm free to take up questions uh, i i can see a couple of questions on the chat i'll just open them uh, is gst registration required for uh, sole proprietorships yes as i answered uh, earlier gst registration is mandatory uh, provided you clear the threshold uh, of uh, 20 lakhs or 40 lakhs if you are a service provider 20 lakhs is the limit 40 lakhs is for the uh, goods uh, if you are de dealing in goods it could be a trading or it could be manufacturing or a production so even if it's a sole proprietorship the registration is mandatory what are the approved tax exemption by interministerial board for startup india scheme related to coconut so not just coconut but uh, any uh, organization that gets the uh, startup india uh, uh, you know uh, the tax the startup india benefit uh, you can apply for the interministerial board uh, approval and uh, there is no income tax for 3 years so once you get that uh, approval uh, you have an exemption from income tax for 3 years and this can be taken up during any of the first 10 years of the organization so generally what happens is uh, when you are starting up you, your profits will be much lesser uh, but uh, over a period of time, you end up. So even if you apply, the, the, initially it was like when from whenever you applied, you could. Uh, it was for the next three years. However, government understood that you know even if you applied for it uh, now, uh, the profits might come in much later. So that uh, you know it is only probably the seventh, eighth, or ninth year, or the eighth, ninth, or tenth year that you will have maximum profit. So you could opt that scheme and uh, take the tax exemption in during the any time in the. Uh, first 10 years but it has to be in a consequential year so once you apply it has to be the next three years together so you cannot say i'll take some exemption in the third year then i'll take the exemption in seventh year uh, like that that is not possible but if you can say you can decide six seven eight would be the years or you can say uh eight nine ten would be the years in which i can take the income tax exemption so like that you can take the tax exemption and uh, the interministerial board approval is required it is a time consuming process and also uh, they give it only for uh, innovative startups. So you need to show that, prove that innovation to get that tax benefit. Uh, any other question? Uh, sir, one question actually. Sure. Uh, it is, uh, the farmer produce uh, is exempted from uh, taxing, right? You said it earlier. Uh, uh, so suppose... basically, it depends on the activity. So there is no blanket exemption, but again, activity. If it's a pure agricultural activity, yes, 100% exemption you can claim. But if okay, there is value okay. addition involved, then uh, you, it, it, it has to be, in the income tax provisions will have to be checked for giving the exact answer. Okay, uh, can I present a scenario? Actually, uh, Madhya Pradesh is producing wheat. The farmers over there is uh, into wheat cultivation. And okay. we here in Kerala, I mean, I am in Kerala. Uh, mm -hmm. We, a farmers group here, want to uh, take wheat from farmers in Madhya Pradesh. Mm -hmm. And uh, regarding that one, uh, we suppose uh, some 30 or more farmers and uh, collect wheat from them and transport it to Kerala. Mm -hmm. uh, what are things we have to uh, but take? Then this, is not a, yeah, so this is uh, basically just a trading activity. So this is not an agricultural activity as such. Right. I so, mean, in that, in that case, uh, uh, what will be the tax pay uh, i mean payable and uh, how it can be done yeah so basically uh two things to keep in mind uh wheat probably does not have a gst so gst exemption will be there uh for, for, because if, if you're not doing any manufacturing or value addition gst probably will not be there uh, as long as you're not branding and selling it across so it'll be a, a zero rated supply for that from the gst perspective however okay. profits uh depending on the organization that you have uh, for example, if it is a partnership firm, whether it's a private company, the tax rates applicable on those rates will apply to your organization also. 
if this is a farmers producer group then uh, uh, what will be uh, if it, it is same as the <laughs> company no see farmer producer group has to have primary producers involved so unless you are primary producers you cannot form a pa- farmer producer company okay, you are uh, with, with this activity you cannot produce a farmer producer company because you are doing only a trading activity you are not producing it you are not a primary producer right right uh, so it uh, comes under the general category and uh, uh, we have to pay the tax yes you will have to and uh, i mean uh, regarding the tax actually uh, how it is done actually uh, if uh, we, it is exempted from tax then how the government can uh, charge this tax uh, i mean from which uh, you see there are different rules right so income tax is on the profit gst okay. is on the turnover so okay. on your sales and purchase you you might end up having an exemption but okay. uh, on the profits you are liable to pay tax even for okay. and uh, also to, one thing to keep in mind is uh, you might because there is interest rate movement of goods you mm-hmm. you might have to take up gst registration because right, right. Uh, uh, for interest rate transactions uh, gst they they insist on gst for movement of goods so okay. because of that you might have to take the gst registration but tax impact would be zero because uh, we tries and all generally i i mm. i i'll have to go through the exact products that you're dealing with to give you a 100% answer but generally yeah, actually the, the, the next like, stage that we, we are going to do is that uh, we will uh, i mean pulverize that wheat into wheat flour and right. uh, once you start branding it, gst is applicable branded yeah. goods gst is applicable so only yeah. so we have to uh, i mean provide gst for this uh, wheat flour that we are selling only right yes yes when you brand and sell for sure you will have an, end up paying gst right right the other purchase uh, will not come under gst purchase if it is uh, a wholesale i mean probably my will not because it's whole grain that you are purchasing you might have an exemption but uh, it doesn't matter because your liability comes in at the same point of sales and uh, there you will have to pay tax so for whatever purchase you know whatever is the value of the sales you end up paying tax so right, right. okay thank you sir okay uh, any other uh, any other questions uh i think i've answered all the questions uh, feel free to let me know if there are any other questions or else uh, we can wind up the session uh Uh, also i'll do one thing i'll just uh, mention my uh, phone <coughs> number here so that in case you have doubt you can reach out to me yeah sir if there are no questions no uh, we can wind up today's session uh so i'll just put my phone number uh, you can reach me on uh, that number and on whatsapp so in case you don't uh, get me on the phone you can uh, reach out to me on uh, whatsapp on this number and uh, i can help you out with all those things <laughs> yeah thank you sir thank you uh will wind up uh, yeah uh, sir i uh, have once again thank you for uh, accepting our invitation and uh, delivered a wonderful talk uh, and uh, again if, if there are any questions no uh, you can contact uh, sir directly and uh, thank you sir Th- uh, thank you thank you thanks a lot and uh, thank you to all the participants here and one more thing uh, we don't have uh, sessions for uh, tomorrow and after tomorrow we will meet again on uh, tuesday and uh, we have the session on uh, start of financing okay and uh, thank you one and all thank you uh, thank you cpcr for uh, giving the opportunity thank you all for the patient listening thank you thank you so much thank you sir thank you sir